don't waste the gold. Gotcha. This is episode 133 of Wayne In with Travis Hartman. I am B Money, the producer. That over there is the talent weekend, Trav. We got a handful of things to talk about. We want to jump right in. On Joe Rogan's podcast, you have Terrence Crawford, who was interviewed this past week, and it looks like he's wanting to target the winner here of Jermel Charlo and Canelo Alvarez, which that fight is September 30th in Vegas. What do you think we can draft? Terrence Crawford taking on either Jermel Charlo or Canelo Alvarez. That sh- should that be who he's going after next? Yeah, why not? You know what? Like and that's where I'm at now. I'm the like, world's you know, your oyster. It is, and this guy's the pound for pound best. If you're the pound for pound best, because at one time Canelo was too, and Canelo had the balls to keep moving up and keep moving up and keep moving up. Finally, got silenced at 175 light heavyweight when he lost to Bivol. Um, I wouldn't say he got silenced, but he got beat. But why not dare to be great? Because if Crawford loses to those guys, who cares? But I'll, I'll make sure everybody. There was a big rumor going around where Crawford was like, "Yeah, yeah, I'll fight Canelo at 158." No. Crawford said, I'll fight Canelo at 168. He goes, I'll fight him for the super middleweight undisputed title. And Jermel is the 154 pound, mm-hmm. which is the light middleweight um, undisputed titles. Crawford has the opportunity to win four different undisputed titles in four different weight classes. Now that. Phenomenal. Now that is what you call unheard of. Unheard of. Right. So he has done it twice now. And, and I believe we were talking pre production about this. A lot of people get this wrong. And I think mm-hmm. Joe Rogan even got it wrong in his podcast, which he gets a ton right. But uh, but what was the reference point there on those two? Yeah. So Joe Rogan on his podcast, he, he also Instagrammed it and said that Terrence Crawford is the first boxer to ever be undisputed in two different divisions. Not factually correct. The reason is Terrence Crawford is the first person in the four belt era to win in two different weight classes, undisputed in two different weight classes, and that's the WBO, the WBA, the WBC, and the IBF. Those are the four recognized sanctioning bodies in the Mm -hmm. world since they've all been here, which I believe it's the 80s. I believe all four together have been here since the 80s. So it's still like 40, what, 43 years, whatever, 40-something years. Phenomenal. Not taking anything with Crawford because if anybody knows, I've been a Crawford cheerleader for a long time. So I'm just trying to correct a lot of people because a lot of people do listen to Joe Rogan, and he probably didn't do it on purpose. He's not a boxing guy. Right. But make sure everybody knows that, that Terrence Crawford is not the first to ever do it. Right. He's the first to do it in the four-belt era. But now imagine if he jumps up and does it again, and then God, does it again. Insane. Four, the potential to do this in four different weight classes. That's incredible. Two is incredible. The, One is incredible. And, and we, we got to give props to him because and we t- we've talked about Terrence Crawford for years here, right? And obviously, you've been a big advocate of his. You fought him in the ring, um, so you know very well his talent. I sent you a video earlier, I think maybe even today, of just his strength because he's not – you know, compared to like B Money, he's not a big guy. He was a high level. St- he was a state wrestler. Correct, but the amount of weight that he was deadlifting, he was deadlifting over four hundred pounds for being for what does he typically walk around weight wise at? Well, he went up to welterweight, which is one forty seven. Anyway, yeah. he turned yeah. pro at one thirty five. So this guy is not, walking around one fifty five. Yeah, maybe? this guy's walking around in his one fifties. Videos of him deadlifting over 400 pounds in street clothes like it's nothing. This guy is strong. I don't think people recognize his actual strength. And that's uh, obviously it's translated very well in the ring for him. Uh, But he's finally getting the notoriety he deserves. So that would be interesting. Targeting that winner, Jermel Charlo, Canelo Alvarez, possibly then uh, going toe-to-toe with Terrence Crawford. Kind of crazy to talk about, right? I mean, it's very crazy to talk about, but that's how you you dare to be great, man. Like, that's what people want to see. Yeah. I don't want to see somebody win all the time. I want to see somebody dare to be great. And challenge themselves. Now, I think we can, Trav, that eventually he can't go up any further because if he tried to, let's say, jump up into the heavyweight ranks, it's not going to work out. And speaking of no, the heavyweight ranks, we're talking Alexander Usyk taking on Daniel Dubois here. Actually, this weekend, August 26th, it's gonna. Uh, if you're in the states, it's gonna be on ESPN Plus. I would say main event ring walk, probably about 5, 15, 5, 30. Uh, ESPN Plus once again. Uh, if you have the streaming service uh, already, uh, that guy is depending on who you ask, the number one or number two heavyweight in the world. He's holding three of those four belts. Um, yep. Yeah, like that segue I went from the little, smaller, medium-sized guys, medium-sized, sorry, medium-sized guys <laughs> to the heavyweights. But this is a this is an important fight, okay? Because we is. we wanted to see Usyk and Fury. That's not happening. I don't think I don't even know if that ever will happen, to be honest. 
But are we sleeping on Daniel Dubois? Um, listen, I, I don't think I'm sleeping on him because I've seen him fight. I've seen what he has. But yes, do I think Usyk beats him fairly easily? Yes, I do. So if you if that's considered sleeping on him, then I guess then I am sleeping on him. <laughs> but I think what's going to happen is he's going to go to sleep. Mm. So he's going to sleep on himself. I don't know. So it'll be, um, uh, once again, ESPN Plus, um, and they're fighting in Poland. So is this going to be one of those fights where, oops, I forgot to catch it? That's eh, okay. Yeah. It'll yeah. be one of those fights where you just kind of look out for the results. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, actually, it's during the day for me. So I always love those during the day fights because... I go to bed super early now, so in America when these fights are happening, they're like at midnight, and I'm like struggling to stay awake. So these are actually perfect for me. I will tune in because of that. It's going to happen at 5 or 6 p.m. here in Florida. Yeah, you could eat dinner so and watch that fight. I'll probably watch that fight on, on a Saturday. Like That's a nice little afternoon delight. I mean, here's it's the same th- conversation we have with the heavyweights. We can travel. It's this. It's like, okay, uh, that, that's a cool fight, but these aren't the fights we want to see. Yep. And that's getting very, Agreed. very disappointing. I'm trying. Let me pull up, if I can, briefly here, what the betting outlook looks like on this fight here. It's got to be a heavy favorite. I, I would mean, imagine like, it is. I mean, like a, something crazy. I'm almost there. Do a little song and dance. For those watching us on YouTube, we appreciate it. Uh, you're watching us do a little song and dance here. Um, and if you're listening to us on Spotify or the other audio apps, we do appreciate it. Please subscribe below. Please like our content. Give us a comment, feedback, whatever you think. We do appreciate the support. We appreciate the subs- uh, subscribing uh, below. And, and here we go. A money lie, oh boy. Uh, Usyk is a minus 900 favorite with Dubois coming in at a plus 550 over under on the rounds. We can travel looking at six and a half. So <laughs> it's going to end in a knockout. What yeah, they're saying. you would think That's what they're saying. Vegas is uh, typically not wrong on a lot of these things. 12 round heavyweight action for the WBO, IBF, and WBA heavyweight titles. But Usyk is still missing that fourth one, and who knows? I don't think he'll ever get the chance to actually fight the man for it, and we're talking of one Tyson Fury, who also has some action coming up. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about in a couple weeks. Uh, we can, Trav, let's transition away from more of the global scene, though this is still global. There's still global activity that happens on these local shows, and it's hard to call them a local show anymore. Yeah. Because this one that you, that you were in, in uh, uh, present for on August 18th, that was Most Valuable Prospects 2, which was on DAZN. Uh, which was here in Orlando, Florida at the Carib Royale. It was brought to us by uh, MVP, or Most Valuable Promotions, yep. as well as Box Lab. Um, we can Trav, you were there. Let's get a rundown. Let's get a little bit recap of this thing. I, I don't want to shortchange these shows anymore because yeah. we are starting to get some primetime matchups on these cards, especially now in conjunction with MVP. Um, very exciting action from what you were breaking down with me. Why don't you recap it for the folks listening at home and watching at home? What'd you see on Friday night, this past Friday night? Well, the last show we were at MVP most valuable prospects one, mm-hmm. which I believe was in May. Yes. It was the first, um, co-promotion that box lab did with Jake Paul's promotion company. And I thought it was their best show they have ever done to date mm. back in May. And it's going to sound crazy, but this was their best show they've ever done without question. The, the level of competition on both sides was impressive. Not just so on the MVP, most valuable prospects one, we had a lot of the a side guys that were there were like, yeah, they were good. Sure. The talent was insane, but their opponents weren't necessarily as insane. It was a little, a little lopsided, not crazy lopsided, but the, the winner who was supposed to win ended up winning for sure. Like, right. By a lot. These fights, not necessarily. It mm. was a little bit of sprinkling up some knockouts, some high-level decisions, um, some new prospects that I think you're going to see on the major scene, and mm. this is why it deserves to be talked about. Um, a real quick one that's not probably on the major scene yet, but this Crystal Rosado, it was her pro debut. She is a Amanda Serrano right. prospect, and Amanda was in her corner as well. She won pretty easily in the—I think it was the second round. I could probably, probably could end it in the first round, but she won— that wasn't even the the kicker of him. I mean, it started off Lorenzo Medina, who you've seen before mm-hmm. as well, heavyweight. They call him the giant killer because mm-hmm. he's a little smaller. He's 230-something pounds, but he won impressively. The guy's very slick, and he's 19 years old. Yeah, so yeah. It's, he's got I, a, some of those, I saw some of those punches. Uh, yeah, he, he can punch, oof. but 
Maybe he doesn't have to worry about the Wilders, the Furies, and those guys because they're going to be long gone. He's 19. Stay down here. Wait it out. Maybe fight Richard Torres. We talked about that. That would be a good So one. that's kind of the heavyweight scene we talked about last week on episode 132. Check out uh, that, that, that posting uh, on YouTube or wherever as well. The heavyweight scene, it's going to look different. In, in just a couple few years, it's going to be different because yeah. the main guys, the top five guys, six guys, aren't really fighting each other. These newer, younger guys, they will, but fresh next faces. Couple of years. Yeah, but fresh young faces, they're going to enter the scene pretty shortly. Pretty shortly. So it's interesting. So, yeah, Lorenzo Medina, you know, maybe we can do some matchmaking right here and throw, mm-hmm. out, throw out the word Richard Torres. Richard Torres. That could be a crossroad, not a crossroads, but that could be like one of those fights to where you both meet and it's, it's Torres's hardest fight to date and for sure be Medina's hardest fight to date. And whoever wins that, there you go. He ain't, ready. He ain't, he ain't ready for Richard Torres Jr. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, be money. He's not ready Torres. for that. He's not ready for that. I would like guy. to see it. I would love to see that because I think Lorenzo Medina now is 8-0. and mm. And the kid can fight. He's got skills. He's slick. I just don't know. Even though he's 233, he's a he's a, he's a little softer of a 233. But heavyweight's the division he needs to be in. He's not that soft where yeah. he could make 200. So he needs to be heavyweight, yes. But he's got, he's got the Andy Rose build. But he's undersized. Yeah. I don't see him competing with the six foot five, six foot six, Luis Ortiz's Wilder's Furies. But they, no. but they said the same about Ruiz, right? And you're right. And I don't know if I'm putting him that slick, but Medina's only 19. Hmm. The kid is very slick. His confidence is through the roof. He was talking to this guy in the ring. He was like, I mean, the kid's confident, and I like yeah. it because he he obviously works hard. He perfects his craft, and he's very slick. So that fight was awesome. He stopped. A, I think a guy was three and zero or three and one. I think that was an undefeated, undefeated Cuban guy. Um, and he beat him. He knocked him out like in the third round. He hit him with a brutal sh- couple brutal shots, yes. and then just beat him down at the end. But it was good. That was like a little appetizer for even more awesome fights. Elijah Flores, who we've also seen fight. Right. I don't understand their matchmaking with him though, because now I've seen him fight like three really good level fighters and have extremely close fights that. If they were somewhere else, you could say the decision could be a draw or whatever. He's I've never seen him in a robbery. I'm not saying there's no been no robberies, but he's been in very tight fights. Mm. Like the other guys have come really close to beating him. Um, it depends on what you want, what you look for in a fight. But he fought another guy, Elijah Williams, who was undefeated as well. Five or six and oh guys. These guys are five or six and oh and are already fighting each other. Mm. And the only reason I bring it up is because that's the type of fight that I want to see in like ten rounds or twelve rounds. And I want to see both of these guys when they're like 10 or 11 and 0 when there's something on the line. Right now, they're just young and, and fighting each other undefeated. Great for the fans. I felt very lucky and blessed that we got to see that fight so early because both of these guys are high level. 144 pounders, so they're welterweight. They're probably more uh, light welterweights, 140s for sure. But be money. The level of that fight, if anybody was in attendance, you watched that fight, you're like, holy crap, these two guys are they know what they're doing their movements they were fast they were powerful they were countering i mean and their movement their spacing was phenomenal it was a phenomenal fight and this was right here in orlando mm. um so and we've seen a larger flower fight before this next fight though is a really cool one and i love it because we watched him fight last time in may this guy julian smith he is deaf okay that doesn't seem like a lot to people but then if you actually get into the logistics of what it takes to get to where he's at being deaf what it takes when he's in the ring to fight being deaf. It's not like he's partially deaf. He's deaf. Like Mm -hmm. there's sign language at the very end when he's doing the press conference. But he fought uh, Julio Rosa, who's from right here in Orlando, Florida. Crazy good fight. Very close. It was a six rounder. I scored it four rounds of two for Julian Smith over Rosa, but it was a very close fight. Mm-hmm. But it was just really cool to see him in the ring after that. The the guy who the, the deaf guy, Julian Smith, the deaf boxer. They call him the quiet storm. Pretty cool. It's pretty cool. But think about it. In between rounds, when you're trying to tell him what to do and everything, there's not time to sign stuff, right? I mean, you have time, but it, I mean, you definitely have to be focusing in rather than just listening. You only have yeah. a minute, so it's like really fast stuff. So you can see sure. he's really paying. He's like looking at their lips really close. Um, also, the end of every round, he can't hear the bell. Yeah, he literally can't hear the bell, and the referee has to be in his mm. sight to do it. But he punched after the bell three or four times. This is on the zone. You can go watch the replay. He punched after the bell quite a bit. He didn't hear it, and the referee couldn't get around in time to get him and jumps in there. You know, it wasn't his fault. But it's just to see somebody like that, and then just to hear people making excuses in their life why they're not where they want to be. Right. And you see this guy who's literally seven and two as a pro now fighting at this level. It's just 
I don't know, man. It's a great story. The so, Quiet Storm, Julian Smith. It's a good story. Uh, we talked pre-production about like logistics of how a fight like that probably should be. And I don't know what any sort of sanctioning laws or rules might be around the ring anyway. So if I'm speaking out of turn, that's fine. Uh, but in other sports where there are deaf athletes, um, typically there's a usage of lights a certain way. If there needs to be, you know, in let's say basketball, there's deaf athletes, basketball. Sometimes you have to utilize light systems in order so they know certain things are happening. So perhaps if there's a way to put a light system on all four corners or all, uh, you know, you know, kind of on the pole behind the turnbuckles on the ring. Maybe that's a way to kind of avoid some of the late hitting and, and the ref if he's out of placement trying to break that up. Perhaps some structure like that makes some sense for when there's a fighter like this. Uh, because last thing you want is for his opponent to eat a couple of punches, and that's going to be the deciding factor of a matchup, yeah. right? Because, I mean, you're not allowed to hit after the bell. Let's say he Correct. catches the guy after the bell and knocks him out. Yeah. He didn't do it on purpose. But it's still an illegal foul, correct? Because the guy can't continue. So what do you do? Go to the scorecards. If four rounds have been completed, that's what you would do: is go to the scorecard after accidental foul. But if not four rounds have been completed, it's a no contest. So you're right. I think that there is a lot of things we can do nowadays, especially with technology. I think yeah. that you're right. Maybe on the all four posts, they flash. Yeah. Maybe after because you know how they do the 10 second hit when there's 10 seconds left in yeah. the round. Maybe the lights flash. So yeah. now he knows to hey get ready to quit. And then when the bell rings, flash the lights. Because even like a, I think that's pretty even good. Even a idea. vibration or something won't really you. <sighs> There's other stuff going on in the ring where you won't be able to tell what that is, but you can see four lights flashing at yep. you from every angle if you do it that way. I don't know. Maybe it's just something no, logistically I think that's to kind talk of about. I think it's brilliant because I, I think that you're saving this guy from getting um, into some kind of controversy. He's yeah. already, you know, one step behind because he's deaf. You right. Know, give this guy every opportunity, which I think he's got now. Obviously, he's seven and two as a professional boxer at a high level. Um, but I think you're right. That's pretty cool, actually. We. I think we should, I'll probably message maybe Box Lab and them and be like, hey, if you guys ever thought of doing something like this, just on all four of the posts, just a little strobe light type of deal where it yeah. just flashes and it's on all four posts. So he'll, ha no matter where he's at in that he'll ring, be able to see it. he'll be able to see that. And, yeah. his, and his sight, I believe, is, is fine. Yeah. So that's a great idea, Be Money. Yeah. I, I think it's worth I'm sure there's more that goes into it, like the AV side of it with, with regard to the camera crews and stuff. So, I, you know, that would be me kind of talking out of turn, like not understanding that. But it seems like a solution. What else did you see there, uh, you know, recap of this card still? Yeah, so then... Julian Smith versus Julia Rosa was a mm. great fight, right? Mm -hmm. But then we lead into the co-main event, which is somebody that you haven't heard of. Damien Lescali. I don't know how to say I'm not saying his name right, I believe. Probably not. But it's L-E-S-C-A-I-L-E. -E. He's a welterweight uh, versus Hugo Noriega, who's a welterweight, 146. Holy crap, guys. Like, it was... No, I said that wrong completely. <laughs> but either way... No, no, I didn't. I said it right. So co-main right. co event... Co-main event co was the event. star of this show. Dude, 100%. Yeah. Co-main event was the star of the show for sure. The other fights just was like led up to that amazing. This yeah. like built up, built. It just kept getting better and better and better. Co-main event hit and it just, this guy's a lefty. Uh, Ronnie Shields trains him, who's trained a bunch of world champions. He also was trained by uh, Goosen, um, Goosen Tudor was the promotion company, but uh, Joe Goose in his name, I believe. Mm -hmm. And he used to train him for a little bit, and now he's been with uh, Ronnie Schultz for the past couple of fights. I think he's only 4 or 5-0, and oh, and he's already fighting these WBA Continental Latin America's welterweight titles, which is like for top 15 rankings. Like, the guy impressed me big time. He fought a guy who was taller, longer, rangier than him, and he dominated. Like, he fought a Cuban guy. Both guys are Cuban defects, so you know when they come here from Cuba, they can fight, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. But ironically, they both really didn't fight like Cubans. They traded shots. They didn't box and move. They were like trading shots. But the reason why it's it's important to bring up is because Damien, this kid's in the welterweight division. Who's in the welterweight division? Terrence Crawford, um, Earl Spence, all those guys. Mm. It's a great division. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying he could beat those guys. I'm not even coming close to saying that. But I think he can compete. Up and coming competition. Oh my gosh. That's what we I want think to see. this guy is a prospect to look out for. And we got to saw him he, see him here. He's a prospect to look for. Damien Lescale. I don't know how to say his name, but it's L E S C A I L L E. Welterweight. Ronnie Schultz trains him. He's a lefty. Phenomenal talent. I mean, he's he's gonna sneak up on some people because they haven't heard about him. And, but that's exactly what you want to see on a show like this. Yeah. Right? You want to see kind of from top to bottom. That's why it's called most valuable prospects, right? Mm -hmm. That's the name of the show itself. Mm -hmm. You want to see this. And it's interesting. You had mentioned, gosh, these guys are all kind of like 
four, five, six and oh, seven and oh, and they're already fighting each other. Love it. that. That's interesting, right? Because you're getting competition a little earlier than traditionally you would see some of these fighters get. Usually you're not seeing that to what, 10 and oh, 11 and oh, and you're yep. starting to get some of that equal level competition, equal level playing field. So for from a boxing fan perspective, interesting. Also, it creates more storylines down the road for these guys. Perhaps their, their, their roads go two different ways, but then come Somehow, back to yeah. each other, right? So it's interesting. I, I like this concept, and I like the fact that they're matching up these guys that are pretty level on these records. It's insane, dude. And and there's no not- more no more seven zero taking on the one and eighteen guy. Yeah. And, and here's the deal too, like you can have a seven and zero versus a seven and zero, but that other seven and zero could be absolutely dr- horrific, Just right? Soup but cans. That's why on paper I saw these fights and I was like, hey, on paper they look they look really really phenomenal, right? Mm. I got there and I was like, ah, oh, this guy's six and zero and this guy's five and zero, but we'll see. I know Elijah Flores, I know he could fight. Yeah, I've never seen the other guy, so I was like, ah, oh, maybe his record's not legit. No, man, they're legit. So like, people that know boxing are like, ah, oh, records don't mean anything because they really don't. It's who they fought to get to where they're at, but also you see these guys fight, and you're like, okay, this guy's a legit seven and zero. He's yeah. a prospect, six and zero. He he can fight. That's what we saw. And these guys, man, I'm telling you, the undercard, well done on the matchmaking. This is Box Lab and Most Valuable Promotions. Uh, Chico Rivas, I know he works for Warriors Boxing, and they co-promote Box Lab too. He's the matchmaker on hand there, and they did phenomenal. Yeah. And I told him that in person after those fights, I was like, Hey man, matchmaking was phenomenal. Good. Kudos to you for getting these guys to fight each other at such a young spot in their careers. But you know why that is, is cool. Be money is, I think that's been the knock on boxing, right? That these guys fight too many tomato cans and that O means more in boxing than like MMA and UFC. Right. Right. I think UFC now finally has kind of, um, flowed over into boxing, meaning these boxers now are like, you know what? I don't care about the record anymore. I want to fight the best no matter what. Yeah. And they're fighting them early. So you're not seeing these 50 and O's like Mayweather's anymore, but that's because Mayweather wasn't fighting these guys at five or six and O. He right. was fighting pro boxers, but they were, they were, they were building him. Now yeah. these guys, I think it's going to help some of these guys in the long run for sure to be um, a lot more seasoned by the time they get to 10, 15, 20 and O and fighting for world titles. They've already been tested like that. It is going to help. But dude, I think we're seeing a small shift in professional boxing, the landscape of it. And you know who started that shift a little bit? Jake Paul. He did. The boxing landscape, because of a guy like him, a YouTuber the past couple of years, he's been going against the grain. And guess what? He promoted this show. He co-promoted this show. His promotion company did. So this guy really is changing the landscape of boxing. For the good or bad, we won't know for years to come, but I think right now, I think it's good. You be careful because I can't go back and, and edit the Mount Rushmore of boxing episode to put that face on there. I'm not doing that. Um, I won't we, make you do that. So weekend Trav, that was, I mean, great show overall. We didn't even highlight the main event. That was Nestor Bravo uh, victorious, but even to his own words, kind of yeah. fell flat, correct? Yeah, I mean, it. listen, I have saw Nestor Bravo fight twice now. I mean, you both. You yeah. saw him fight the, his last fight. I saw him fight two fights in a row. The first fight was a no contest. I left that fight wanting more, Mm -hmm. meaning I wasn't fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Friday night, August 18th at Crib Royale, I left that fight with the exact same feeling. Mm. He won. He did. He's 21 and no, I think now. I mean, he's undefeated. He's a 140 pounder. I think he's ranked seventh in the world by the WBO and eight by the WBA or vice versa. But one of the, he's ranked seventh and eighth. Um, they have some work to do. Yeah. He has some work to do. Back to the drawing board. Yeah, I, and they. I hope they have a good architect behind that drawing board because this. I don't know what to say. The guy, he's a nice guy. Uh, there's nothing. I I'm mean, it's tough. It's tough to be critical of a guy he, that's you know 21 and 0 or whatever. And right? I know. And this is you want to ask me my honest opinion. Like, what's this guy's longevity in the sport, or can he compete against these the world champions? And at right now, 140 pounds is Devin Haney. Devin Haney with. He's not in the same league. No. He's not even close. And he's ranked in the top 10 in the world. And I'm not saying that to talk smack on Nestor Bravo at all. Not even close. But you want my honest Just boxing being realistic, opinion? Yeah. yeah. Nestor Bravo's got work to do. Yeah. He needs to he needs to go back to that drawing board, find out his why, hmm. find out what he needs to change, find out what he needs to do, and do that. I like that. Find out his why. What is your why, folks? Um, <clears throat> I got a question for you, and it centers around why as well, We can Trav. Why? Why are we facing another allegation of banned substances? Why? And this time in the ladies' ranks and one that's highly touted, 
that being one, Alicia Baumgartner. Undisputed. Uh, I think one or two of her samples from back prior to her last fight, uh, she got popped for two banned substances. Now, it's still pending, you know, investigation and things like that, but it's not a good look, is it, Weekend Trav? Nope. It's, I mean, it's, I, I, I don't, I don't know what to say about this because here, here's the goal for a defense, right? So if, if you're Alicia Baumgartner's team, your whole goal is to not really claim that you're steroid free, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's to muddy the waters just enough. So the average fans like, oh no, this is probably bullcrap conspiracy, right? And that's what they're doing because mm-hmm. they've already posted a couple of things like, oh, she pes- she tested good June 16th, um, then she tested positive July 12th, and then July 15th she tested clean, and they're trying to muddy the waters enough to, to make it look like she's not doing it. And I don't know if she is or she isn't. I don't I know. I just know that. And she was she was fourth. She jumped on as well and made comments the same day it came out. So it wasn't like she hid behind anything, basically denying the allegations as you would expect, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but uh, this is, you just don't like to see it. Uh, even if it ends up not being accurate. But think about this. There was a positive test July 12th. Mm. I believe the fight was July 15th. You have a positive test three days before this fight. And as a commission and as a testing organization, how do you not report that? How do you let that fight even go on? Correct. At worst case scenario, that fight should have been postponed. Correct. Okay. Okay. And this is what I don't like, and this is my fighter coming out of me where I'm a fighter. I want the fighters to be protected. I don't want a fighter fighting somebody that's on steroids and then later on have that fight reversed, whatever else, because they're going to have to do something with that fight result. They're going to have to take that fight result back if if this ends up being true or whatever. And and it's crazy we're seeing if this stands. How is a test off? Like, your testing needs to be on point. Like, how do you mess a test up if you're the testing company? Whatever it is, but... My whole question is, even if there's a question mark, which July 12th, there was a question mark. She had adverse resort results on a test. Mm. How do you let that fight go forward for the safety of boxers? How can you as a commission or even a promoter claim that you care about the safety of fighters yeah. when you let that freaking fight go on? And that's the interesting part. That's what we're not hearing about is that Nobody's talking aspect. About that. I want to know why you let the fight go on. Promoters, commissions so far have been pretty well insulated from... The pointing of fingers here, and if that is the case, we can try if you bring up a very, very valid point. You are putting the other person at risk, okay? Now, who's just, I mean, listen, we're talking three days before a fight. I don't, I don't know when the dates were on the, on the testing prior to the 12th. June 16th, she tested, and that sample was clean. Uh-huh. And then July 12th, it, okay. the sample was dirty. And then July 15th, the, right after the fight, they test them again, and that was clean. So that's weird, so, right? I don't know. Just something just... I mean, it is, but it isn't because I don't know enough about it, but I do no. know that I've been following some stuff with um, yeah. steroid abuse. Look at abuse us. Do we look like, like we are abusing <laughs> uh, mean, like, banned substances? I mean, no, B Money's not. pretty thick over there, so I don't know. Yeah, but, but, yeah, yeah not like that. I, uh, I don't I'm know not, for sure. I'm not cut like Alicia Baumgartner. Um, I, I'm saying if you look at this woman... Women naturally do not build muscle as good as men because men have testosterone, right? Women do actually have testosterone. They do, but they have more estrogen than testosterone. So women generally don't build muscle that way. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. We don't know. What we do know is what we just said. June 16th, 2023, she tested clean. July 12th, she tested positive. July 15th, clean again. So I don't know. Maybe they're their people didn't cycle her on or off at the right time and something happened. Well, I don't know. So we don't want to make allegations ourselves. So all we're doing is reporting what is out there. And this happened a few days ago, a few business days ago. We're recording this on Sunday, drops on Wednesday. Uh, so this happened, you know, what was it, Wednesday or Thursday last week is when it yeah. dropped. So all we're doing is kind of reporting what's out there. And it's important because this is a champ. This is the champ, and just is kind of like one of the reckoning ladies of the women's division, bringing the the boxing fire back and and someone to watch. I mean, she's an exciting fighter, and she has charisma and that sort of thing. So you hate to see this, uh, but we shall see. I guess time will tell whether or not there's something odd about that test, or whether or not you know this is just all nothing to talk about. I think the the, the lawyer team with Wang and with Travis Harden have told us that we're not allowed to make Correct. these allegations. We are just. Correct. We don't. We are we, just regurgitating information that has been thrown out there. That's all to we're us. doing. We don't want our that's views to be guys. impacted like they have been. Me too, uh, so, please. so with that being said, let's go ahead and switch gears again. There's a lot of gear switching today. Um, 
We're going to talk a one in a way. Nay, no, wait, in a way. And we're talking Manny Pacquiao. Maybe not in the way that you guys might initially have thought uh, we were going to go with that, but Manny Pacquiao interested in possibly being in that corner and helping train in a way and an advocate of him fighting in the States. You and I have talked. That needs to happen. I like where you went with that, B-Money. I loved how you just like referenced all that and brought that Boom. in. Like Boom. that's that's you you are the talent from of the segues. From negative news items to positive I like what you did potential there, rumors. I, like what you, I love Actually, what you it's did all there. Uh, so in a way in Pacquiao, that would be an interesting combo, fighter and, and uh and, uh, well, trainer. it's not really rumors. I think Manny Pacquiao actually came out and said that. that's a direct oh, quote we go. from him. So it's but, not a rumor. That's what, a direct quote from him, but we haven't heard from him. But Inoue I would camp. like to see on Inouye's camp and yeah. also the potential of him fighting in the States. That would be massive. The U.S. audience who doesn't know this guy needs to see the monster. We need eyeballs on him because he basically, for the most part, only fights in Japan or on that side of the world. Yep. Which, great. Fame, fortune, everything, he has it over there. But... Uh, for him to be in that pound for pound discussion, which he consistently is amongst is. boxing aficionados yep. to the average fan, no one knows who this guy is. And they should. They don't. And they should because he's a top. He was the pound for pound for a hot minute over Crawford. And then Crawford. Literally for four days, we had it. Literally. You could see one of our videos we like too. You said it though. For one of our views, yeah. for one of our bo- podcast moments, he was the pound for pound fighter for four days. Four days. Four days. Four days. Of the but, week. But. Um, Here's the deal, and this is, listen, I'm an American talking, and then maybe globally they're going to be like, oh, you're a cocky American. No, I'm not. I'm going to no. tell the truth. If you want to set your legacy, and I'm, I'm going to just, I'm going to reference only boxing because that's what I do know. If you want to set your legacy in boxing, you have to come to America, period. Every great fighter overseas has to come to America and lay their claim. Yep. They do, and that's just the way it is because historically speaking, we can even just say North America because Canelo, Mexican, the Mexicans are, they, they, and they do it in America though too, but they're Mexican, but they but do it in America. There's two places in the States, main places, there's other places, but there's two places that you have to fight. One being Madison Square Garden. 100%. But priority like number one would be Vegas. Vegas. Yeah. And it's true. And that's what you do. And here's, it's, it's 100% factual what you're saying. And it's right. That's why guys like Tyson Fury selling out arenas in England. Um, Great. Ricky Hatton used to sell out 40, 90, no, I think 90,000 seat arenas in Manchester, Wonderful. England. Like they're selling those. And you know what he did? He did that. And he's like, you know what? It's time. I got to go up to America. Absolutely. Came to America, got knocked out by Floyd Mayweather. Went back home, re, 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 reaccomplished his stuff, came back, got knocked out by Manny Pacquiao in Vegas. So it's, it's just the truth. In a way, you want to make your claim, you want to make your claim on superstardom, you got to come to America. You do. And that's just all it is. Coming to America. That has got to be the the cement to the legacy it for is. NOA. It is. He needs to fight in, my opinion would be Vegas. I think Madison Square Garden has lost its luster, in my opinion, over the last call it 10 years or so. But there's still a lot of fights that happen there. Uh, but he needs to fight in Las Vegas under those bright lights amongst the fight combat sports fans, which every combat sport flows through that city now. It does. You got to see, he has to be there. And he has to, I mean, and the audience is different. I mean, when you go to a Japan, uh, uh, when you go to Japan and watch those fights or when you watch them on TV, the crowd's a little different. They are very polite. They're very quiet. They say nothing. They make no noise until after the round's over. And you know then what? they sit in their seat and they're nice and quiet. And they, you know, little claps. He needs to come to Vegas. And he needs atmosphere. to prove himself to average fans he's already proven himself to boxing fans we know yeah we know he's good but the average kind of fight fan or sports fan they need to see this guy up up close and personal we can't be watching him at nine in the morning stateside anymore superstardom comes when you come to america it does period i don't anybody could say what they want it's true though yeah Right, like it's you have to come to America, yeah. stake your claim. Stake well, look at what claim. happened to Ivan Drago when he came to America, <laughs> and he and he fought and, and, and fought against uh, um, Creed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was it was an exhibition fight. Okay, he killed the guy. But the, but truthfully though, changed guys his career. Like, think about it though, guys like Anthony both Joshua. their career changed both their careers. <laughs> That's a movie. Oh, okay. <laughs> but back to real life. <laughs> Anthony Joshua yeah. was selling out arenas. Guess what? He's like, I'm going to go to Madison Square Garden. And what happened? That's where the legends yeah. get are made. From that point on, the trajectory of his career yeah. 
so he far. Doesn't, he doesn't want to come back over up here. Up to date, he's like, I'm going <laughs> to stay, stay home, man. Like, that's where you I'm saw. I'm stay in England. That's where you saw the first. Or Saudi Arabia. You saw the first brick of his mental wall fall over. That was that was the beginning of the crumbling act. I mean, like, like we're not like, I mean, we live in America, obviously. I'm, I love my country. Absolutely. I do. But I'm, bis- I'm being honest. Think about that. Mm-hmm. All of the greats have came over to America and won. And whether they're great or not, the, most of them are Americans too. But there's been some that come over here for sure. But you have to lay your stake here. Mm-hmm. You can come here, win, and then go back for sure. But you got to come here if you want that superstardom, if you want that television, you want that big money. It's in America. You make a name for yourself at home, wherever you might fight. Mm-hmm. England, Japan, wherever it is. You make your name there. You make your cement, your legacy fighting here you do i mean there's two places you said them: madison square garden mm-hmm. in las vegas mm-hmm. anywhere in las vegas really mgm t-mobile arena there's a right. lot of places right. there's a couple runner-ups there we got california staples center yeah. a lot of greats come out sure. of staples center i mean tyson free versus deontay wilder yep. one happened in staples center um and then you have texas there's yep. some big fights in texas you have dallas stadium american airlines there's some decent fights there and then hopefully i think maybe florida comes in a little bit close there because there's a hard rock here there's some casinos here but otherwise it's america the biggest fights in the world, not attendance wise, we're not saying that because you get you get like ninety thousand in a soccer arena over there in England for yeah. sure. But I'm just saying like ratings wise, money wise, yeah. legacy wise, it's in America. Yeah. You gotta come to America. Whether it's even fighting in America or not, it is I'm not even saying that. You just have to come to America to get that American television, get that American money, get that American like um ratings, all of that. Yeah. It's in America. Because I don't care where you're at in the world. If a fight's on at nine o'clock or starts at nine o'clock or ten o'clock in the Eastern Standard Time, and you're in England, you're in Japan, I don't care what you're doing. It's your guy, you're gonna stay up and watch it. You're gonna yeah. wake up early and watch it wherever you are. That's okay? the greatness, man. I mean, that's where that's how guys like Mike Tyson were so great too. Mike Tyson was so great that he was fighting at like midnight mm. our time in the US. But those guys over in England, they were 6 a.m., 5 a.m. They were getting up for guys like that. Or staying up. Or pro- probably closer probably to that. Really yeah. drunk. They're at staying the pub, up. <laughs> drinking that. I got some I got some England oh, friends. Yeah. They love to drink. Yeah. And I, I love drink. Matter of fact, I got some England friends from Manchester and London. They were at the fights with me mm-hmm. um at the Curb Royale. They love oh, to drink. Boy. They love their fights. They love to drink. I love it. Well, right my alley. well, we can have a couple uh, things that we wanted to mention. First, let's jump into our drink of choice tonight. Oh, we are right. drinking another Maker's Mark Private Select a bourbon. Last week, we did the t- in 2019. This is the 2020 Private Selection Maker's Mark. Um, uh, what I will say is drinking it. I don't know if I get a lot different from than 2019 than the prior year, other than the fact of memories. It gives me the memories of the year 2020, and I'm not sure if that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> definitely not. But weekend Trav, what do you think on the rating here? Let me see what we did last time. So this time. is the Generations of Proof. It's a private select mm. maker's mark, mm-hmm. and we did 2019 last week. We're doing the 2020 version this week. And this, again, is a, is a birthday present from my main man at Windermere Collision, um, Cecile Ramsamy, a.k.a. Tom. Thanks again, brother. Thank you. Um, I think I gave it a pretty decent rating last week. I'm going to go again with it, and I think I'm going to go like 7.3. Okay. 7.3. And you know my three things. It's, it changes. It, it flip-flops. So I don't even need to go over that, but 7.3. Um. I'm cheating a little bit because I looked at what last week we did and it doesn't Cheater. it doesn't change a lot for me this week on this newer new bottle, the twenty twenty bottle versus twenty nineteen. I feel about the same. Your three things, I feel the same. Um it tastes good. I don't know. I smell good. Uh, it smells good. <laughs> um, so I'm going to do a 7.1, which gives it an average rating of seven point two boxing gloves, which <laughs> amazingly enough. Was that the average last seven point two? Yeah. So, <laughs> but I think I rated it higher though. Didn't you I? did seven five. Yeah. And I rated lower. So, right. anyway, so we're gonna come in at seven point two boxing gloves for the Maker's Mark uh, Private Selection twenty twenty. Mine was probably lower because it was twenty twenty, and nobody likes twenty twenty. I don't know. I, I mean, yeah, the whole big C thing sucked, but I think there's a lot of good things that happened too. Whoa, 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 Dwight, what's the big C? We, we can't talk about that because it hurts the ratings. Uh, okay, so There's that's, the, big that's the bourbon. Saying, we did want to give a shout-out to the DL Podcast 
out there on Discord. I know Week and Trav, you were uh, on the show for those guys out there uh, just recently. Any thoughts there on, on the DL podcast? Yeah, yeah, guys, I appreciate you guys having me on. Um, like, it's so funny. Like, I, I think I did most of the talking, which is generally what happens, right? Like, B Money knows this. He's been co-host beside me for three years now. Um, but they just throw up a topic to me, and I run with it. Like, I know boxing, and I love boxing. And that's and great. I just talk about it, and it, it was, it, was it makes it good for them. Yeah, it's easy. <laughs> And honestly, when I so I was a journalist for four years for a, for a, not I was about to say major newspaper, but a big newspaper, thirty thousand subscription newspaper. It was decently big, as local, but anyway, I was a journalist there, so I I know a little bit about that stuff. And what they always told you is that when you're doing interviews, a good interviewee um, is a person that you can just throw something to them and they just go. Hmm. You don't really have to say much. That's a good, whoever you're interviewing, if they can do that, you're like, that guy knows what he's doing. He's pretty, he's pretty solid because you don't have to say much. You don't Open have to end pry. Yeah. yeah. And that's a good person that you interview is a person that you don't have to really completely keep, keep jabbing questions, keep jabbing questions. They're like, make it more of a conversation, throw them something and let them run with it. Yeah. And I've, I've known that for, since like 2008 and I love to talk about it. So I talk about it. And then when I finish, they ask another one, boom, boom. I'm off. It's like off to the races and I love it. But they're they they're two. It was two guys, um, DL podcasts, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, they they were solid. I mean, they they were boxing fans, and they had a lot of a similar opinions. We agreed a lot, um, but it was fun. I hope I can go back on it again too. And I love this cross mingling with podcasts. Like, did they're not you, our competitors. Did you give uh, the Jake Paul love to those guys as well? <sighs> I did. You did. It was in a different way, though. Oh, like okay. people. I come across with these opinions like I'm a Jake Paul fan and I'm telling everybody, Jake Paul, I don't, I don't care if you hear this. I'm not necessarily a Jake Paul fan. Right. I've become, in my older age, I've become more um, unemotional about topics. And Jake Paul, I'm unemotional about. I look at what he's doing and if you want to, li- if you want to talk to some of the biggest business guys in the world, and they will tell you some of the most successful people are the ones that go against the grain. Sure. And they make their 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 movers and shakers. Whether you like it or not, they are disruptor. And there you go. And I mean, without a single doubt, Jake Paul's not just like he comes in and acts different for one thing. He's been going on for a couple of years now, right? And it's still working. Yeah. It's still it's not going selling. anywhere. It's not going anywhere. So I think what he's doing is it's not terrible. And we talked about that on on the show too. This guy was like, and I agree with him. I think in five to 10 years, be money. We have a lot of kids now, kids that are, they're YouTubers, right? You have have younger kids. They watch YouTube a lot. They all know who Jake and Logan Paul is. I didn't even know them as YouTubers at all. I only knew about Jake Paul when he came into my realm, which was boxing, right? So what I mean by that is, we're having a lot of kids that are watching these guys, and they're like, "Oh my god!" They're like, "If Jake Paul can do this, I want to come. I want to go box." Game. Yeah, so that's not bad. I think in five to ten years, we're gonna have this like boom of boxing because these kids in the younger era are starting now. I think we're gonna have somebody. So hopefully, we're around this long. But our podcast, I mean, we for sure are gonna be. But our podcast, I think in five to ten years. We're going to have a boxer that started boxing because of Jake Paul, Mm -hmm. and he's going to be great. Okay? Remember that I said this. I think we're going to have a boxer in five to ten years that started boxing because of Jake Paul. I'll even go out on a limb. He will be the next pound for pound great. Oh, man. Okay. Put it out there. I do. There, I mean, this, the power this, of social media. Okay, is, this might is be immense. for a future podcast moments video piece here. Yeah, remember uh, this. So you're telling 133. me. 133. Okay, so put it in the books. So we fast forward what ten years from now? You're talking yeah. ten, fifteen I said years. Five to ten. So yeah, I think I think it's going to be closer to ten for sure. But yeah, I think we're going to see the next great. One of the in next ten greats. years. One of the next greats. Yes. That was heavily influenced by, by Jake, Jake Paul. Paul. He's. I like, know people are going to laugh like, at this. I love. Watching his YouTube, and I loved him on the Disney Channel. But because he's <laughs> boxing now, I wanted to become a boxer, and now I'm one of the best in the world. I know we're gonna have gonna that story. That. Yeah, I that's think people, gonna. Be- people are gonna hate me for this, but I'm telling you, 
I feel like Nostradamus right now oh because I'm predicting this. Uh, the opinions. I used to, uh, I, they used to call me Nose Shradamus. Okay, well, bigger nose, the whatever. opinions provided on the Wayne and with Travis Hartman <laughs> show aren't necessarily those of all participating parties <laughs> on said episode. Uh, but there we go. That's we can uh, tell me that's your final thought too. That could just that should just be your last thought ever in life. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to close up the show right now. <laughs> Episode 133. Please uh, support our, sh- our channel. Subscribe below. Give us a thumb up on the video. Pass it on to your friends. If you're listening to us, we appreciate that too. And just any feedback is always, always uh, great, uh, uh, greatly appreciated. So anyways, that over there. Man, can I call you the talent still? Yeah, that over <laughs> there is the talent weekend trap. That there is B-Money, a.k.a. producer, a.k.a. just buzzkill right now. But I still love you. Mm. Oh, yeah. And also, B Money's birthday was last Friday. So, yeah. happy birthday. Where's my Amanda Mr. Serrano happy Pratt. birthday? It wasn't there. She didn't come over to our section okay. at all. She big timed us. It's fine. It's fine. Serrano's big time now. Yeah, you know what? We're big time. This is episode 133 in the books. Mm. Peace out.